virtual, and we've decided to combine Virginia, North Carolina, and South Carolina. And Dr. Ed Barnes with uh, Cotton Incorporated is the Senior Director of Ag Research and an engineer, and he'll be joined by Guy Collins from North Carolina State University, the cotton specialist there. We've also invited several cotton specialists from uh, the different states. Uh, we have Gail Moody Milt here on the call, also Hunter Frame, the Virginia Tech cotton specialist, David Parrish with the North Carolina cotton producers, Keith Edmondson, and I said Guy Collins, the North Carolina state cotton specialist, uh, Carl Brown uh, from South Carolina and Mike Jones from Clemson, the South Carolina cotton specialist, and then Dave Rupenecker with Southern Southeastern. Uh, I would like to go ahead and mention our Cotton Board and Cotton Incorporated members and directors. From Virginia, we have Shelley Butler Barlow and J.W. Jones. Uh, Cotton Incorporated Virginia is Philip Edwards and Jim Ferguson. North Carolina, our Cotton Board folks are David Dunlow and Kent Smith. The Cotton Incorporated folks are Andrew Burleson, Sam Walton, Donnie Lassiter, Rob Fleming, Alan McLaurin and Marshall Newton. And our South Carolina Cotton Board members are Rusty Darby and Frank Rogers. And Cotton Incorporated South Carolina are Davis Calhoun, Doug Gerald, Kent Wanamaker, and Jonathan Berry. And with that, Emily, if you would put up my slide. All right. Any of you that not, don't know what the Cotton State Support Program is, the assessment that the producer pays, 7.5% of it goes back to that state's projects. And it's devoted to the local projects and it's voted on by a state support committee. And uh, each committee has eight to 10 people on, on the state support committee and they meet. Uh, this meeting is giving all the producers that have joined us a chance to see what goes on and how their money is spent uh, on research in these state support meetings. Uh, at this time, I'd like to go ahead and turn the program over to Dr. Ed Barnes with Cotton Incorporated and uh, let him present his slides. Hey, thanks, Monty. Um, I'm going to explain here in a second why I'm the one talking uh, on behalf of Cotton Incorporated today, uh, but I do appreciate this opportunity from Monty and the Cotton Board to share a little more about our state support program. And again, we're going to be focused on Virginia, North Carolina, and South Carolina today. Um, first, to just talk about some funding levels, you know, Monty already pointed out that seven and a half percent of the grower contributions come back to the state. And so here you can see what the funding levels are for each state this year. Uh, and on that chart to the right, you can see that's year on the x-axis and then a number of 480 pound bales on the y-axis. And so you can see that, that uh, those funding levels are proportional to the production in each state. And another thing that helps us keep our, our research, our state support research more level and steady is that number is based on a, a five-year running average. It's a five-year Olympic average. So we throw out the high and low and then uh, average the middle three. And so you can see um, right now, these funding is kind of on the low side. We've, we've kind of gone through a dip and things were looking really good in 2019, but then 2020 was then 2020. So uh, it's gonna make up for it. But anyway, uh, Another thing I wanted to emphasize, these dollar levels only include, you know, the state support program. Uh, we also have uh, in our ag research something we call our core program that is focused on national and regional issues that go, go across straight state lines. And so these dollar figures do not reflect that research investment, which we definitely have significant core programs in all three of the states we're talking about today. It also does not include the research funding from the state checkoff programs. And that's something that's really unique in, about the Southeast. It's a really strong thing for the Southeast. They all have, uh, of course, uh, state programs. 
and we coordinate very closely uh, with the state's programs because they all fund research as well. And, you know, in Virginia, that's the Virginia Cotton Board. You already heard Gail Miltier mentioned. Uh, Jim Ferguson's the, the committee chair for the state support committee. Uh, the Virginia law does not allow us to meet together with the state board, but with Gail's help and, uh, and the Virginia Tech, people like Hunter are very good about making sure that those research uh, proposals are coordinated across those two boards. In North Carolina, and I'll say more about this, uh, our collaboration with North Carolina when I introduce Sky, but uh, we, you know, the North Carolina cotton producers, we coordinate very closely with the help of David Parrish. Uh, and, and David also serves by their bylaws as the state support chairman. And, and then David Grant uh, historically has been very active in their, their research committee. And then finally, last not, but not least, is of course the South Carolina Cotton Board. Catherine Helms has just taken on uh, helping coordinate that from the South Carolina uh, Co uh, Department of Ag perspective. Uh, and then Carl Brown is, is the current chair there. So I just want to say all this is all these efforts are closely coordinated. We're not competing. We're actually uh, in North Carolina, South Carolina, we're able to meet as one board. And then we the, the producers on those boards and on the state support committee decide as a group what they want to fund. And then behind the scenes, we figure out, you know, what where that money is going to be, just what program is going to pay for what project. So it's Again, just want to emphasize it's highly coordinated. Uh, another thing I just want to, you know, I mentioned our core program and just to give you a little quick background on, on how we coordinate some of our state support. Um, each of us in ag research have, have two roles. We have our kind of science, we have a scientific discipline. We're responsible for coordinating that research program across the country, whether that's a core project or a state support project state support project it doesn't matter uh, we're, our goal is to make sure all those projects have their maximum impact and then from an administrative standpoint each of us uh, serves a liaison role between the state program and cotton incorporated so that's why i'm talking to you today i am uh, the coordinator for virginia north carolina south carolina don jones is on the call he covers georgia alabama and uh, florida and then you can kind of see the other assignments up there, Cater and Tom Wiedergardner near the far west. Galen does the southwest, which is you know, Texas, Kansas, and Oklahoma. Then Ryan Kurtz does our Mississippi Delta Mid-South. So that's the role we play administratively. And then you can see we all have our scientific disciplines. Uh, you know, really excited to have Galen Morgan on board now to take over weeds and soil health. Sadly, you know, this year, again, 2020s not going down as a great year. We lost Dr. Bob Nichols, who has been amazing contributions to the cotton industry. Uh, Cater's now taking over a lot of that disease work while we're, we're hoping to hire somebody to replace Bob uh, it, uh, next year. I, I cover agricultural engineering, so that's harvest, some of the precision ag stuff, cotton, you know, ginning, all those areas. Ryan Kurtz does entomology. Um, Tom Wiedegardner has a cotton seed research program. And then finally, Don does our, our breeding and genetics. So with all of us, we try to keep all this coordinated so that we're giving you maximum value for your research investment. Now I'm gonna go through, and I am gonna slight Virginia and South Carolina, so you can write me nasty notes later, you know, complain about it in the chat. Rather than trying to just briefly cover all the projects in these th just these three states, we're gonna do a deep dive on North Carolina, but I wanna acknowledge of course, here's the projects that we're currently funding uh, that are state support projects uh, this year in Virginia and South Carolina. You can see the principal investigator like Dr. Hunter Frame is on, uh, his projects listed there. Uh, Dr. Langston's doing the, the nematode work and then Dr. Sally Taylor, uh, you know, the insect pest management for Virginia. In South Carolina, most of the people are Clemson, but you can see Todd Campbell is listed there. Todd is with the USDA ARS in Florence and is really one of the, the USDA breeder for the Southeast. So it's nice that the South Carolina cotton producers acknowledge his contribution, give him a little bit of money. Uh, and I saw John Mueller is on talk, doing some of the root knot uh, resistant varieties. And then um, you can see some of the other projects listed. I'll show you later a website you can go to and, and look at all of these projects in more detail or at least get the listing and the name. And if you want to know about 
any of these projects in more detail, uh, I'll also provide my email here in a second, and you can uh, send me an email, and I'll find out who's a project manager here at Cotton Incorporated, and they can really hook you up and tell you a lot more of what's going on. Uh, and of course, I don't want to forget to call out Mike Jones is not listed here, uh, who is the cotton special in South Carolina. And that's because the South Carolina Cotton Board is funding his projects. And again, the other thing we do is because we do have two different uh, grant administration systems. If someone has a grant or a, a, a contract with Cotton Incorporated, uh, we try to keep them in the Cotton Incorporated. Uh, pot and then if they have us in, in case of South Carolina of the South Carolina Cotton Board We try to keep all their projects on that board. So they only have one administ administration administrative system to deal with um, And so now we'll just talk uh, North Carolina and this is where I'm going to get ready to turn it over in just a second to Dr. Collins uh, Here you can see the state support projects. You can see Dr. Edmonston uh, has several projects and and um, so the ones in bold guy is actually going to give you a little more detail and he's going to share uh, more detail about his program. So we'll let Guy talk about North Carolina. And then finally, before I turn it over to Guy, here's that website. Uh, if you're uh, in front of your computer and have your phone, if you hold, if you have an iPhone, especially if you hold it up, the camera up to that QR code, it will pull up that link. Uh, if you don't want to try to type it in, if you, uh, but so the, the first link is where we have a listing of our state support information, who the liaisons are, um, who, what projects are being funded in 2020, and then also the bylaws for the state support committee. So all that's very, we try to keep that very transparent. Uh, our corporate website has a lot of stuff on it, so that's why I wanted to give you that QR code. And then if you're interested in our research results, uh, whether that's from a state support project or our core program, uh, Ryan Kurtz has helped us develop this uh, grower facing website called cottoncultivated.cotoninc.com. So that's, there's a link to that as well. If you're looking for some of our research results and, and also links to the different state resources, uh, those are all provided at that website. And there you have my email. So if you do have any questions after this that you don't want to put in the chat, feel free to shoot me an email. And with that, I'm going to get ready to turn it over to Dr. Di Guy Collins. And um, we're very excited in North Carolina. We have two very good cotton specialists, Guy and Keith. And um, for a while, we had lost uh, Guy. Guy is a native. Uh, he's out of Northampton County. Uh, he did his PhD under Keith Edmonston and did a lot of work for Keith. So many of you know him in North Carolina, uh, even before he became his in his current position. Uh, he then went to become the Georgia cotton specialist uh, and luckily he I guess he got homesick and so we were fortunate he came back and this is really where the coordination with the North Carolina Producers Association is reflected they're really supporting very strongly supporting Guy's program and so Guy's going to share uh, what he's doing that that includes support from the North Carolina Cotton Producers Association as well as some of the other projects at NC State that are supported um, by the, the state support program. And so with that, uh, Guy, I want to turn it over to you and, and give a little more detail on some of these projects to kind of highlight some examples of some projects in North Carolina. All right, thank you, Ed. Uh, I appreciate that introduction. I'm trying to get my PowerPoint up here. To... All right, can everybody see that and hear me okay? Yep. All right. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be with you today. I'm going to highlight some of the projects that are going on that are specific here to North Carolina. See similar projects going on in, in neighboring states. And I'm also going to highlight a few of the projects uh, that are going on across the entire belt that involve uh, many of, our, of the cotton specialists. And I, I see some of my Georgia friends online uh, today, uh, even down in Alabama and some of my colleagues in other states. And uh, I'm also gonna talk about some projects that my colleagues here at NC State have going on. I hope I can do uh, their work justice, uh, but a few of those are online uh, today as well. So a few of these I'm gonna breeze right through. Um, and I'm gonna start with my program and what I focus on. And, and most of my work is large plot and on-farm type work. 
And one issue that has, has challenged us in, in recent years has been seed quality and poor stands. I'm not going to talk too much about this, but it's an ongoing issue that the, the further we dig, the more we tend to find. And uh, one of the projects that I have going on right now is in collaboration with our ag engineer. And what we want to do here is essentially reevaluate our replanting recommendations. And this project is, is twofold. One, we want to revisit our recommendations, but two, we want to find a more efficient way of assessing cotton stands uh, in the field and in real time. So this just illustrates how we do this particular project uh, where we have uh, uh, seed mixtures of transgenic and non-transgenic seed. And we just plant that essentially the way it is. So we end up with these natural random skips of various size and frequency. Uh, so it simulates a real world uh, situation, so to speak. And uh, the unique part of this particular project, and this is why we're collaborating with ag engineers, and usually or prior to this project, the way we measure uh, skips in a field is manual measurements. And that's very tedious, very time consuming. No farmer really has the time to spend in, in, in assessing a stand that way, but that's the only accurate method we have. But now that we have uh, UAV capabilities or drones, we can take an aerial image of the entire planted area, so to speak. And here you can see our different treatments in the field. Uh, over here on the far left is our solid planted cotton. Typically we're about three seed per foot on 36 inch rows. So that's 43, 44,000 seed per acre. And then we have a 75% stand right next to it. 50% stand still doesn't look too bad. But when we get down here to a 25% stand and a 10% stand, that's where you see uh, the, these uh, big skips and, and more frequent skips in the field that would necessitate replanting. Then you can see that little tiny cotton there. That's our replanted treatment. So we have these trials both for uh, early season situations and late season. So our early trials are planted on or around May 1st with a replant scheduled for May 25th, which for us in North Carolina, that's our, our last date for crop insurance. And then we have the same thing where we plant cotton on May 25th and replant on June the 5th. Because we Here lately, we've seen more and more cotton planted on into June and it was not uh, necessarily uncommon this year. So it's a fairly neat project. One, one thing we did with some county agents and some other cotton experts was have them go out and look at some of these plots and evaluate or visually estimate uh, the percent of that planted area occupied by three foot skips or greater because that's where our, our current recommendations are based. Uh, so right now we say that if half the planted area is three foot skips or more, generally we can justify a replant. All right, so they were asked to evaluate the area up until that green line, all right? So the estimates, interestingly enough, range from 30 to 80% of that area occupied in three foot skips or more. So you can see there's a wide range and it's all in the eye of the beholder. On average, it was about 60%. In actuality, when we go out and manually measure that, that was 71%. So you can see that there is a, a fairly big difference in, in what we uh, perceive versus what we actually calculate with precise measurements. So hopefully we can uh, develop a, a method using these drones to do this in real time and real quickly uh, with precision. Uh, not to belabor this too much, but what we have found is the drone measuring the entire area compared to just a subset of that area measured manually. It, both are very predictive. Um, you can see these high values right here for this R squared, that's basically a, a correlation coefficient. The higher that number is or closer it is to one, uh, then the, the more correlated two things are. But interestingly, what we found is a difference in the slope between manual measurements and measurements via the drone. And really what that means is the drone is not finding as many zero values or, or scenarios where you have no skips. 
and it's not as likely to find these higher percentages of the planted area in big skip, okay? So by measuring the entire plot area, you know, we're seeing a difference there. So a difference in that slope of that line is gonna affect what threshold we replant. So we're, it's still uh, work being done right now. And so we don't have those recommendations just yet, but we hope to soon. All right, switching gears a little bit. Um, my, my former counterpart down in Georgia and myself started this on-farm variety testing program in Georgia, I believe it was in 2010, and it started gaining some, some popularity, and, and we have the same thing here in North Carolina. This map just illustrates where all of our trials are. We try to represent all of the cotton growing regions of our state, and a lot of my colleagues in other states are doing this exact same thing. And we also have uh, OVT programs in all these states too. So for North Carolina, the OVT trials are in the blue stars, as you can see there, and then the red stars are your large plot on farm trials, and, and we, we cover the entire state. Our map typically looks like this. This year we didn't have as many trials simply because we had some of the worst planting weather that, that we've ever had. And uh, we'll talk more about this in winter meetings, but this is how we you know, evaluate variety stability. We want to look at how frequently a variety can perform at or near the top or within that statistically highest yielding group. Uh, and we are always able to identify several varieties from different brands that can be good performers for us. Uh, so this program enables us to gather a lot of that information just in a single Guy, we lost your audio. Did y'all lose Guy? Us to do those things and make better oh. decisions a little bit quicker. All right, so I always love sharing this slide. This is the, what it costs per acre to, <clears throat> can everybody hear me okay? Okay. Yeah, we can this hear is you. what it costs per acre uh, to make a poor variety decision. And uh, this is always, uh, an interesting slide for me. Too much time here, but if you look at that bottom row, that's the best way to go about making a variety decision. So if you use the best approach to make a variety decision, and for whatever reason, it was not the best variety for that particular environment. Yeah, we lost you again. Many scenarios. So you apply hey, that to our, You yes. want to cut your video off? Your um, your audio is kind of cutting in and out, so maybe that'll help us to be able to hear everything. Thanks. All right. What about now? Yeah. Okay. All right. So if you apply these figures to our overall acreage, just in North Carolina, poor variety decisions can cost somewhere between twenty six and fifty nine million dollars uh, statewide. So it, it this illustrates the importance of this decision. All right, so talking more now uh, about some of the work that Dr. Emerson uh, is taking lead on. Again, uh, the seed quality issue is a big issue uh, facing us in North Carolina and growers across the belt. And uh, some of my colleagues in other states are working on some of these same things, especially the one here at the bottom called Beltwide Seed Quality. That's uh, one that's supported by Cotton Incorporated through core funds, I believe, and it involves essentially all the cotton specialists across the belt. It's basically a survey and, and performance evaluation of, of seed that's delivered to producers. Uh, so uh, for one, we want to see what kind of quality we are planting. Then we can dive into all these other things. So we, you saw some that Ed mentioned earlier about plant populations and interactions with herbicides and things of that nature. Uh, late planting. Some of these with the stars right here, we're collaborating uh, with uh, our uh, seed specialists in our crop and soil science department where we just started this really uh, since August, but we have a graduate student on it. Looking at storage conditions over time, uh, we're looking at uh, better ways to evaluate cool germ. That tends to be the most unpredictable 
test uh, in terms of repeatability or predictability in terms of field performance. Several other projects that you see uh, going on here. So it, we're, Dr. Emerson especially is putting a lot of emphasis on seed quality uh, for, for now and in the coming years. So in my opinion, this is one of the coolest slides uh, that I'm going to show today. And this is from some of Dr. Emerson's work uh, here in North Carolina. And what it really illustrated to me was that seed quality not only affects stand establishment, but it can affect plant growth beyond that point. So this is a scenario where we planted at the only ideal time that we had this year. And that was right in the middle of May, uh, planted on May 15th. And we've got, happened to have two seed lots uh, that both had the exact same worm germ, and that's 87%, but they were very different in terms of cool germ. One was 67 that you see on the right, one was 44 on the left. So in that three to four day period where conditions were ideal for cotton planting, that was the only time during this year that, that we had real good conditions. Now we can see that even cool germ affects not only stand establishment, but seedling vigor and plant growth from there on out. And naturally this can influence yield. So again, you know, this is the daily heat units from the end of April all the way to early June. Ideally what we would love to see is five days in a row of 10 DD60s or more. We don't always have that. And in North Carolina, we rarely have that. Um, but to prove the point here, early May, there was essentially no heat units to be had on several of those days. When we got to the middle of May, this was the best stretch in which we had to plant cotton that we weren't too wet to plant. So after that, when we're right on top of our insurance uh, cutoff date, we were too wet. Then we're on into June or the very late May. A lot of folks had rain during that time that prevented them from planting too. All right, so moving on, um, Dr. Dominic Rizek, he is one of two of our extension entomologists for cotton. Uh, he's doing a lot of work uh, involving really all the major cotton insects. Um, a lot of what I'm gonna show you here is focused more on bollworm or corn earworm. And he's doing a lot of work right now where he's screening for resistance to uh, the three gene cotton. That's a very, very big concern as we move forward. Uh, all the varieties we have or are moving to that R3 gene have the same third gene. So we're putting a lot of pressure on one gene to carry all the weight here. And, you know, you guys in North Carolina know very well, we've had to spray quite a bit, some expensive worm specific materials uh, the past few years that, you know, we want to avoid if we can help it. Um, he has noticed there is less bowl worm damage the earlier we plant. When we get into late May or early June, or even mid-June planted cotton, that's when we see a, a noticeable increase in damage. And that does make sense as we get later. Uh, there's, there's more later set bowls that are more attractive when we get uh, on into August and closer to Labor Day. All right, so your besiege and Prevathon type products still seem to be sus the, the superior insecticides for bollworm control, according to his work. He does a lot of screening of different materials. Uh, he's done a lot of work evaluating the residual effects, uh, especially of Prevathon. Uh, and we can get very close to three weeks of activity. Um, and it does not seem to act, interact with uh, the BT trait. He's done a quite a bit of work over the years with uh, plant bugs or ligus. Uh, and, and a lot of his screening work there has shown that, that diamond, which is a growth regulator targeted to the nymphs, mix that with orthene, and that provides a, some very good residual for the tonic plant bug. This slide just shows or illustrates the difference between 3G cotton on the right and So we still do get a little activity out of the two gene, but there's going to be a big effort, concerted effort to move on to three gene, and a lot of growers already have. There's a big, big difference in, in specific to bollworm damage that you can see there. All right, our other extension entomologist uh, here at NC State is Dr. Andrews Huseth. He is doing some very interesting work um, that 
really looks at behavioral aspects of insects and predictability of insect problems. So here on the bottom left, what, we, what he has here is a heat map. And this all ties back to thrips. You don't see thrips listed here, but it all ties back to thrips. And many of you are familiar with the thrips predictor uh, that we have. You can find that on our cotton website. Uh, the Southeastern entomologist developed uh, that app, so to speak, or that program. And it, it works very well uh, for a lot of different conditions, but it's, it's most accurate for, for cotton in general terms and in, in areas where there's a lot of cotton grown. Um, but what he's found in his research is cotton planted next to wheat uh, could be a little more vulnerable to thrips than that model would predict. So ultimately, this is to tack on to that model and add other insects to it. Uh, what he's really noticed is especially for tarnished plant bug is the timing of that wheat die down or wheat harvest, which is for us is gonna be in early to mid June. That's a real good indicator for when there's gonna be plant bug movement into cotton. So um, ideally what they wanna do is, is tack on to this thrips predictor and add more insect species uh, and, and make it a little more precise for those species. And we do see a fairly high correlation uh, between adults and nymphs for a number of different species that, that you see there. And when you start seeing that drastic buildup, then that's gonna be a, a trigger for movement, uh, especially from wheat into cotton um, or, or any other type of movement. All right, on, this is another heat map that he uh, has developed using historical data. Uh, from these, these moth traps that we have all across the state. Uh, and this is a really interesting one too. So here, what he's trying to do is develop a corn earworm prediction model. Uh, currently, we have the black light traps and those are monitored maybe every three or four days. You know, they're not real time. It takes time to upload that information into the system. What he's wanting to do is develop a series of automated traps which he has done and has got in place now. And that is gonna document environmental conditions at the time and it can, it can document in real time when insects go into that trap, uh, which is also very, very interesting. So here using historical data and hopefully some of this newer technology, we can develop a program that's a, a predictor for when there's gonna be movement of corn earworm uh, coming out of corn and into cotton based on environmental conditions or other uh, pest dynamic uh, situations that may be out there. This specific map uh, interestingly shows that where you have a lot of soybeans, you're more likely to have a heavier uh, movement of, of those corn earworms into those areas. They, they tend to be the hot spots is where we have a lot of soybeans. All right, so uh, Dr. Cahoon is our fairly new uh, weed scientist. He's been here uh, three years, I believe. Uh, this highlights a lot of his ongoing work. Uh, first and foremost, he's evaluating the new HPPD inhibitor weed control system for cotton. Uh, that's an exciting, fairly new technology that's gonna hopefully be on the horizon soon. Uh, it's where he's evaluating pre-emergence programs uh, using Elite 27, or this isoxyflutol, or commonly known IFT. Uh, evaluate early post-emergence programs, including uh, this, this herbicide. Now, he's done quite a bit of work with Elevore, mixtures with 2,4-D and Dicamba, Culex, looking at horse weed control and other winter weeds. Uh, he's looking at environmental factors uh, that influence cotton tolerance to warrant herbicide, which that's been a big issue these past several years, uh, as we, we have more and more issues with warrant injury in cotton. So we want to determine you know, what situations may or may not influence that. Um, furthermore, he's trying to determine the, the safety intervals for replanting cotton into a failed stand where warrant was applied. And then, you know, in 2019, we had some dry planting weather, uh, which, you know, can occur for us in, in here in, in North Carolina throughout the Southeast. Uh, and I remember my days in Georgia, there was some of that then too. So we wanna look at cotton tolerance to warrant following delayed emergence, where we plant into dry conditions, so to speak. 
Uh, then he's looking at, at uh, the late planted uh, cotton tolerance to tank mixtures of herbicides and other things. I, I think Dr. Cahoon gets a large number of calls about this uh, every single year. And then uh, lastly there you see uh, tolerance to multiple exposures of 2,4-D. So this slide illustrates some of the work there at the top left. You can see where there was no warrant applied and then warrant applied one week prior to planting. Uh, some of the data associated with that, you can see no warrant. And then at various times leading up to planting, the closer we get to cotton planting, the more injury we have and uh, the, the greater the yield loss that, that we would see. Uh, so this is interesting enough in terms of um, you know, this helps him identify when it would be safe to replant cotton into uh, where warrant was applied uh, to the previous cotton. Uh, looking at multiple exposures of 2,4-D, you can see there the closer that he was able to get to reproductive growth and the, the sequential timings that you see there, then the more uh, injury and yield loss uh, that occurred there. And then lastly, on the far right, looking at the IFT, that new HPPD uh, technology and this isoxyflutol, uh, a lot of what he's seeing there, you can see a lot of these herbicides that we, we commonly use in different tank mixtures, but uh, it'd be interesting to see all this uh, from his comments uh, last night, he indicated this IFT is uh, fairly safe and is not injury as injurious as uh, some of the other residual products that we use and can be effective when when properly tank mixed with other residuals uh, for pigweed control. All right, so that will that really highlights a, a lot of the things I wanted to talk about today. And um, this is our Cotton Portal website. I always show this in any talk I give. Uh, everything we do in some form or fashion is gonna appear on that Cotton Portal website. All of these other things are accessible on that Cotton Portal, like our variety calculator, our plant and conditions calculator, that thrips predictor you heard me mention, our economists have this crop comparison tool. And then lastly there, I have the NCDA uh, seed quality database. And I know uh, several other states other outside of North Carolina are accessing that database to, to visualize the seed quality once we get into planting season. So I, again, I appreciate the opportunity um, to, to talk with you today and Monty, I guess I'll turn it back over to you and, and I'll be happy to take any questions if anybody has any. And some of my colleagues I know are online, uh, so they may be uh, able to answer some questions too. Okay, Guy, thanks for doing that. Uh, I don't see any questions in the chat. So if any of you want to unmute your mics and 